Hello, and welcome back to the Camera Rolling Podcast. I'm your host, Ronnie, and today is Season 2, Episode 3, and I'm going to be talking about Legally Blonde. But of course, before I get into that, I'm going to talk about some recent watches. So, my first recent watch is actually not a finished one, because I only got partway through it, but the movie is called Distorted, and it stars Christina Ricci. It's a 2018 film directed by Rob W. King, and it's a psychological thriller where a woman and her husband move to a luxury community after a home invasion leaves her feeling unsafe. However, she suspects the community that they move to is brainwashing them. Like I said before, I could not make it through this movie. Uh, I got partway through, and I was just bored, to be honest. I love Christina Ricci. I think she's great, but... Uh, This performance wasn't that great, to be honest. I also think for a movie to have this particular concept, it's got to be a lot more alluring and more fast-paced. I need to be able to be more invested in the characters, and unfortunately, I just didn't feel that invested. The other movie that I sat down to watch, finally, was American Psycho. It's a 2000 film directed by Mary Heron and stars Christian Bale. The story follows Patrick Bateman, a banking exec who narrates his inner thoughts about the world around him as he commits heinous crimes in his free time. I wasn't even five minutes into this movie when I recognized that this movie has a very Hitchcockian feel, and of course I looked it up and Mary Heron was inspired by Hitchcock's films to do some of the imagery for this film, and I think she did an amazing job. I definitely could see American Psycho being something I talk about in the future because there's so much there to talk about, both in the story itself and also just its cultural impact. But without further ado, let's get into Elle Woods from Legally Blonde. In my episode about Cher from Clueless, I mentioned that Elle from Legally Blonde has been talked about as potentially being autistic coded. So I thought today I would investigate that. And of course, I'm going to preface this video sort of like I did the last one, that I'm not trying to diagnose her or anyone. I also know that it's not that serious, and that's why this video is just for fun. So Legally Blonde is a 2001 film directed by Robert Lukedic and adapted from the book Legally Blonde by Amanda Brown. It stars Reese Witherspoon as an LA sorority president hoping to marry her boyfriend Warner, but when he breaks up with her on the grounds that she's not serious enough and she's too blonde, she joins Harvard Law School in order to win him back. So like many girly movies that I watched growing up, this was another one of my favorites where it sort of combined the idea that a ditzy girl could also be extremely intelligent. And I think Elle Woods is someone who shows potential to be a neurodivergent character given that she does stand out so much amongst her peers. I'm also sort of going to be using the IDR Labs uh, test to sort of outline some of the main categories that could also be used to diagnose, though I'm not going to use it specifically to diagnose, but they are a good indication of certain aspects of autism. They cover 10 different categories, which I'll explain now. They have depression, fixations, abnormal or flat speech, noise sensitivity, social difficulty, anxiety, abnormal posture, poor eye contact, tics and fidgets, and aggression. Now, obviously, these 10 categories don't fully cover everything to do with autism. It actually covers a lot of the difficulties that people with autism face, but it doesn't necessarily outline the other things that may also occur or be present. However, I thought these would be sort of helpful in looking at the movie as a whole. So let's get into the movie. The opening sequence clues us in on how much of Elle's interests lie in traditional feminine things such as cosmopolitan, the color pink, fashion and makeup, and designer fashion. This would fall under both her fixations and or special interests. Within her first interactions with her friends, you can see how she has a considerably high voice, but it becomes even more apparent later on in comparison to the people that she's surrounded by at Harvard Law School. While a lot of autistics are noted by their flat speech, abnormal speech also falls within that, so having an extremely high voice or high-pitched voice uh, 
when you probably don't need to or having a super expressive or uh, fluctuating voice could also count as being under that sort of symptom, I guess. So at the beginning, Elle is preparing for a date that she has with her boyfriend, Warner, and everyone is guessing that this is probably when he's going to propose, given that he had dinner with his grandmother only a few weeks prior. They're assuming that he got the ring from her or a ring from her and that he's now ready to propose. So in doing this, they go to pick out a dress, and when she goes to pick out a dress, she's able to tell the salesperson is lying about the type of stitch in fabric because she has extensive knowledge of fashion and related subjects such as fabric and stitching. And again, this would fall under fixations. So Elle and her friends also do these like little claps and squeals and kind of jumping up and down, and I think that this is a great way of regulating excitement through stimming, and I would put this under ticks and fidgeting. I think that can kind of fall hand in hand as well as trying to regulate. So when you have more anxiety, you may fidget with things, but if you have more excitement and you're not sure how to regulate it, you might stim by jumping up and down, squealing, or clapping your hands. And Elle does this pretty frequently at the beginning. So Elle and Warner sit down to have a fancy dinner at an intimate restaurant, and it's the perfect place for him to propose. And while they're speaking with one another, you can actually tell that she has a pretty wide vocabulary, even though people think she's ditzy. This is another indicator amongst a lot of autistic people that they tend to use a larger vocabulary than maybe necessary. It also happens that a lot of young autistic people will use a pretty large or wide vocabulary around people when they don't really need to and don't understand the context in which you would actually use a large vocabulary such as writing an essay or in an academic setting. So when Warner decides to break up with her, she immediately becomes emotional and forgets the social norm of staying quiet in an intimate restaurant. And a lot of neurodivergent people have trouble expressing emotion, whether it be not enough or too much on the outside. A lot of people think that autistic people don't show emotion enough. And while that is true for some autistic people, because it is a spectrum, there are autistic people who fall on the opposite end of that and show too much emotion or show very extreme emotions. So in this particular moment, obviously anyone would be upset and probably want to cry, but I think most people would understand that they're in an intimate restaurant and that being like loud or having anyone notice you is very uncomfortable socially, but for her, she's in the moment and she just starts crying. And she has a very weird cry, and I'm not sure if it's for comedic effect or if she literally just is supposed to sound like that. As he tries to console her so he can drive her home, she has a hard time understanding how he feels the social pressure to marry someone different from her. She doesn't understand that if he loves her, why would he not just marry her no matter what? And I think in them trying to make her seem dumb for not understanding this is just her not understanding the social aspect of how he views marriage. A lot of people view marriage as a social activity and a social standing or social status. And for him, she does not make the bill. Whereas in her mind, social status is not important. She's simply in love with Warner and she wants to marry him and doesn't understand that he does see the social element even if it's not important to her. And I think this type of dynamic could be really prevalent between people who are neurodivergent and neurotypical not seeing eye to eye on something that seems obvious to the other one. So of course after this, Elle is extremely depressed and she pretty much lays in bed for a week watching romantic movies, eating chocolate, and crying. I think for many autistics who aren't diagnosed, they may experience bouts of depression when something bad happens, but not stay depressed for long or consider themselves to have depression, which I don't think that depression should necessarily be a qualifying factor for autism, which is again why I'm not saying that IDR labs or their test is fully encompassing or diagnosing, but still. 
more or less her friends try to get her out so they can cheer her up so they go to the salon and when she sees warner's older brother is marrying a law student in the paper or in a magazine she believes that the woman being a law student and not her other social standings or attributes are what make her serious enough for marriage I know for me, I've struggled with things like this where I think one thing makes so much sense and then someone explains it to me that, okay, but there's all these other factors that play into it and how other people feel and it's not just this one thing that makes something this. I think L equating these things to one another is very indicative of this very black and white or all or nothing thinking that tends to happen when you're autistic. And you can see that even more when the people around her, like her parents and her advisor, see why she can't just get into Harvard when she knows nothing about law, even though she doesn't understand why that's different. And I think, again, this is another moment where I relate a lot to her in the sense that I have certain interests that people may view as very unrelated to other things that I may also be good at and don't see how those things feel the same to me. Because I think for Elle, school is school. When you're smart and you can easily recognize patterns, school is very easy in most cases. So for Elle, getting into Harvard Law School is just a matter of studying and working hard and being fixated on Harvard Law School and then getting in. So of course they talk about what she needs to get into Harvard Law and so this is when she begins to study law so she can get into law school and she's able to relate information that is seemingly unrelated to most people but points to her larger understanding of the subjects like the connections that she makes in her uh, I think admissions video? Yeah her admissions video. <laughs> While to everyone else, everything that she does seems ridiculous, it does, I think, point to her larger understanding of sort of this baseline for things that a lot of autistic people also tend to have. When she receives a 179, which she only needed a 175 on the LSAT, she jumps up and down and is flapping her arms. And again, this is another instance of her stimming. And I think something to note in this transition between her being at Delta Nu and being in a sorority surrounded by people who have similar interests and she understands is that she's very comfortable in that community. A lot of the things that are in the categories of IDR labs don't really come into play in this situation because she's in a comfortable position. She wouldn't experience heavy bouts of depression or anxiety because she's in a comfortable environment. However, this will change and be tested as she goes to Harvard. I also want to take a moment to talk about her dog, Bruiser. She talks to Bruiser like he's a person, and I know a lot of pet people do. I talk to my cat like he's a person. You'll notice how when she talks to Bruiser throughout the movie, especially in the moments where she's approaching her dorm and people are yelling demeaning comments at her, that when she talks to Bruiser, she's essentially talking to herself. She's trying to hype Bruiser up and saying, oh, they're going to love you. They just have to get to know you. Like, we're going to be okay. And again, I think this is a way of calming her anxiety. And again, in the context of her sorority, the things that she does, her mannerisms, her demeanor, and the way that she speaks and acts may seem really normal amongst that community. But she doesn't seem to notice how that doesn't necessarily translate to every situation. There's even a man who yells and points out that the way she walks is weird. And this may seem normal to her, but is abnormal to the culture at Harvard. And I think this could be a result of two things, either her not realizing the social norm is actually going to be something different and that she needs to sort of assimilate if she doesn't want to be noticed, or she doesn't care that she's getting noticed and she actually is more hard-headed or stubborn and more set in her ways and wants to continue to do things her way, which I think either one is pretty okay, and both of these scenarios could be related to autism. Something I thought was interesting is that when she goes to her first class, she actually wears blue. She wears blue instead of her signature pink, and I think this is her first attempt at trying to fit in. She even puts on glasses and says that she totally looks the part. And this could be a hint towards her potentially masking or realizing that she needs to mask in order to fit in. 
it's definitely something that she doesn't feel like herself in. And I think she can sense the tension from her interactions just when checking in and in the introduction circle. And I think this goes towards a larger element of masking within the autistic community, which is also this element of playing a part, that when you're masking, you're sort of pretending to be someone that you're not. And I think that this is sort of her way of being able to mask comfortably is to pretend that it's a part that she's playing. And you can see more of her understanding of social interactions and patterns being mapped entirely by her experience as a pretty person in her community in LA that values beauty over everything. However, outside of that community, most people have a more casual gait, they don't say hi to everyone, and generally wear more functional clothing like dark sweaters and jeans for New England weather. Though she was fixated on making it into Harvard, she didn't have a clear concept of the learning environment because in her experience, there was more pressure put on socializing than classwork, even though she had an easy time with her classwork. She had a 4.0, which is why she immediately tries to jump back into things with Warner when she first sees him in the hallway before her class, in that when she engages in the conversation, she immediately talks about, oh, I'm going to start a mixer and we're going to party and it's going to be great instead of saying oh what are you doing here like this is an interesting place for us to meet the first scene in her class is a great example of how i think neurotypical and autistics may differ in communication when asked a question and not having an answer l tells her the reason is that she didn't know there was a pre-class assignment but the professor views this as an excuse and it's unacceptable even though there was no prior direction from the professor that we know of. There's this weird element of communication that even confuses me as an autistic person when I'm engaging with neurotypical people. Like if somebody asks why I'm late, I'm going to tell them why I'm late and when they get mad at me for telling them why, I'm always very confused because there is a reason and people treating the reason as an excuse is doesn't make any sense. Something I thought was interesting was that when she sits on the bench outside of class when she gets kicked out, the man, Emmett, sitting next to her asks if she's okay and <laughs> she says yes but then proceeds to talk about her issues with the class anyway. <laughs> And I think Elle is kind of similar to, to me in a way, or I can relate to this in a way that she'll feel angry or frustrated for a second, but when talking to people, she sort of forgets that feeling and opts to be bubbly and engaged. So after class, Warner approaches her and as they're talking, she finds out that the mean girl from class earlier, Vivian, is actually engaged to him now. So to help regulate after that news, she goes to the salon or to get a mani-pedi. And this is when she meets Jennifer Coolidge's character, so you know it's about to get good from here. So later, when a study group with Warner and Vivian rejects her, another girl, Enid, pop pipes up to make fun of Elle, too. And Elle makes it obvious in her retort that she's not mean to people who don't start it. Which I think is something to note in a way that many autistics interact with people by not having an opinion or harboring negativity towards people who are strangers or different, but more so reserving that energy for people who actually deserve it. Because she's very clearly rude or mean to Vivian when Vivian starts stuff, she will retort and be rude to her. And again, Enid really isn't her main antagonist, so I don't think Elle thought of putting any negative energy towards someone who doesn't necessarily deserve it or understand the situation. Later, Elle overhears Vivian talking about a party outside her door, which it's obvious she's trying to bait her, but Elle takes what she says at face value, and she believes she's invited to a costume party, so that's how she arrives. I think it's also great to note that in this scene, Bruiser growls at Vivian, almost trying to warn Elle of her intentions. So at the party, she shows up and she's in like a sort of house bunny or playboy bunny outfit and everyone is clearly not in costume, but she decides to stay and approach Warner. And in trying to talk to Warner, Warner says that she's not smart enough to do the internships in Callahan's class, and it finally dawns on Elle that he'll never take her seriously. That he doesn't believe she's smart enough or mature enough to be taken seriously amongst his family. And this final realization is what sets her off to become more serious about her studies. 
Thus, we have a little montage of her doing more schoolwork to prove herself. She begins to wear more clothes that have her style yet are more appropriate for the environment instead of a costume-like portrayal that she had in her first attempt to fit in. Something I think is really interesting and, and important to note about this montage is that even though she's becoming more serious about her work, she still has time and includes her special interests. She's still engaging with fashion, exercise, the salon, etc. She's just doing it as well as working towards her goal in her fixation towards law school. And I think a great turning point for her or a great moment for her is when she helps Paulette or Jennifer Coolidge's character get her dog back from her ex and she realizes how much she actually enjoyed helping people with the power of law. So later when the internships are coming up, her professor asks her for her resume to sort of apply. And so when Elle gives her resume and the professor notices it's pink and scented, it really harks to how Elle always does things her own way with confidence. The only time she seems unsure of herself is when it's something new to her or something that may garner negative attention like answering a question in class wrong. So Elle ends up getting a spot on Callahan's team because he has a really big case coming up and so he needs some extra help from some of the first years. So Elle is on the team, Vivian and Warner are also on this team. Callahan explains that the case has to do with this woman named Brooke Windham and she is being accused of shooting her late husband. Brooke also happens to be this exercise guru that Elle also sort of has a connection to sorority wise and also because they're both just into exercise. So Elle obviously makes this connection and her reasoning for Brooke not shooting her husband is made using logical connections that take her knowledge of human nature at face value. And yes, while exercising does give you endorphins and that makes you happy, there are other reasons to kill people other than unhappiness. Meanwhile, with her friend Paulette, she's trying to get Paulette to flirt with the UPS man and she starts to give her advice and this is when we get the iconic bend and snap scene. And Elle's understanding of flirting is using patterns of interactions between men and women to make connections. So her manual or her quote unquote manual includes the bend and snap as a method of attracting attention, even though this doesn't seem natural or make any sense. So later, Elle actually gets Brooke's alibi because she doesn't want to give her alibi because it's too embarrassing and would ruin her, but Elle goes and talks to her and she gets it, but she won't reveal it to the rest of the team because she feels more loyalty to being a friend and keeping her word per Brooke's request than that of Callahan's need to win. And I think it lends itself to this sort of stubborn nature and very strong belief of things being one way or the other or this sense of justice or morality that a lot of autistic people tend to have and not to say that all autistic people are like just and moral but her sense of it is very strong in the sense that she would rather be loyal to Brooke and do what Brooke wants her to do than to do something that would upset Brooke and wouldn't be necessarily in the name of friendship because for Elle the point here is to get Brooke free not to win the case. Later Emmett and Elle have to go talk to the ex-wife of Brooke's husband. And when talking to Emmett in the car, Elle defends Brooke in saying that while people outside of their world were, would consider what Brooke does to be telling women they're too fat, the people like Elle and the people inside of that world view what Brooke does as encouragement to feel good about one's self-image. And I think this harks to sort of the way that autistic people can sometimes view things in a way that puts a more specific spin on something that may not necessarily need to encapsulate all of the opinions of other people. Likewise, I think this just goes for a lot of fandoms or things that people are fans of that if you're on the outside, you probably don't get it. But if you're on the inside, then you probably get it. <laughs> I also love this scene because Elle calls Emmett a butthead, which surprises him given that they're both adults. And this is another instance where I think neurotypicals would see what she said as childish, but a neurodivergent person 
might see it as the perfect way to describe someone who's being stubborn, but not in a negative or hateful way towards them. And also a lot of the time, the things that autistic people enjoy or their interests or the way that they speak or the way that they do things can be seen as childish, but in reality, it's just a way of regulating or it's just their special interests or it's something they connect more deeply with than they do with things that are seen as more mature. You know, you're really being a butthead. A butthead? Why would you call me that? You know, Emmett, you just need to have a little more faith in people. You might be surprised. I can't believe you just called me a butthead. I mean, no one's called me a butthead since about the ninth grade. <sighs> Maybe not to your face. Later on, Vivian comes to grab some materials from Elle for the case, and Elle seems a bit distant or hesitant when she gives her a compliment. But when Vivian starts to open up and really talk to her, Elle gets more comfortable, and Bruiser also begins to like her. And honestly, I think Bruiser liking her tells Elle that Vivian can finally be trusted more. And I also think this is a great scene in sort of proving that Elle is actually a very good caretaker for Bruiser, given how docile he is. While, she, while it seems she does tend to carry him around like an accessory, I think he functions more as an emotional support animal than anything else. She talks with him and cares for him, and he doesn't try to bark or fight back when he's being held. And especially in chihuahuas, they can be very aggressive when they don't like the person they're with. If your chihuahua is coming at you, barking at you, and trying to bite you, they probably don't like you. I think a lot of people tend to forget that smaller animals do have their own bodily autonomy and value that. So if you don't value that and give them that space, they won't like you and they will become aggressive. So the fact that she carries him around everywhere and Bruiser is still very docile and still very loving towards her shows me that she's actually a very good caretaker for him. So the trial begins and there's a few people that take the stand, like the woman they interviewed earlier, which was the ex-wife, and also the pool boy named Enrique, and he goes on the stand lying, saying that he had a, an affair or a relationship with Brooke. However, Elle makes the connection when she has an encounter with Enrique that Enrique is actually gay because of her knowledge of shoes along with his knowledge of shoes. Obviously, this is like a stereotype that like, all gay men would know designer shoes, but like specifically it makes sense in this particular case. So later on when Elle visits Callahan, she doesn't view any of his actions as a threat or him coming on to her until he puts a hand on her leg. He begins to compliment her and she takes it seriously, not realizing that his weird metaphors to animalistic nature for work are also his way of saying he has an animalistic attraction to her, which is disgusting. And obviously, when she realizes this, she gets upset and starts to question everything up until this point. So as she walks away, you can see her shaking her hand, trying to regulate what just happened. And when Vivian makes assumptions about her position and what she was doing in there, she just decides to quit altogether. She also runs into Emmett before she leaves and she sort of explains what happens and that her doubts are more that she's trying to be someone that she's not because she doesn't fit in. And I think what Emmett says is just great in this moment when he says, what if you're trying to be somebody you are? When she says, I think I'm trying to be someone I'm not and I think that's a very important point in both character growth and just in general it's a great point to take away that sometimes when you are trying to grow as a person especially if you're autistic neurodivergent or just in general if you're neurotypical too that you can tend to be stuck in your way of thinking that you have to be somebody or that you have to have a certain identity that you've built up but in reality you literally just don't have to stay that way and that maybe as you begin to change that you're becoming someone that you are. Elle also says, I just felt like for the first time that someone expected me to do something more with my life than just become a Victoria's Secret model. And I think she finally has a moment of reflection about how others view her. But what becomes more important is her view of herself and her duty to Brooke 
slash being something she's good at that challenges her. And of course, she gets some words and courage and decides to come back because when Brooke hears that she quit, obviously Emma and Brooke try to get her back. And so she comes back. And this time she comes back as the main person questioning the people on the stand as well as being her lawyer. However, this is Elle's first time being the lawyer. This is the first time that she's questioning someone and so she's clearly uncomfortable as she begins to question the daughter because this sort of environment is technically all new to her. She sort of paces and looks around and fidgets with the papers in her hand like anyone would. However, when she hears about the perm that the daughter received that day, she finally feels like she's officially in her wheelhouse. Because Elle knows everything there is to know about this subject, she can feel confident in how she goes about her questioning now. And of course, this is how she wins the case. If you haven't seen the movie, she talks about how you can't get a perm wet for 24 hours, and so the daughter's alibi doesn't work, and the daughter did it. And one of my favorite moments is obviously when Warner confronts her outside of court and she sort of plays along being like, oh yeah, sure, I'll get back together with you. Just kidding. I just love that she throws his words back in his face like she had been waiting for that moment because I do think there was a very specific shift in which she was like, I don't care about Warner. I care about my craft. I care about challenging myself as a lawyer and as a law student, and this is what I'm focused on, even though I came here for him. But that's essentially how the movie ends. They win the case. She graduates law school at, like, the top of her class, and she's just amazing. And by the end of the film, I pretty much came to the conclusion that she probably isn't autistic, and again, I'm not trying to diagnose her, but I think just more in my opinion, given everything that happens, I don't know if there's necessarily enough there to say that she is or isn't. However, I do think it's interesting to view a lot of these characters, especially ditzy ones who are actually extremely intelligent and able to recognize patterns the way that Elle can. I think it's important to look at these characters still and, and look at them in sort of a way that can depict neurodivergent people in a positive light. Because whether she is or not is not necessarily the important part, but recognizing that neurodivergent people are everywhere and there are a lot of things that neurotypical people do that could also be part of neurodivergent culture. Like, stimming is something that anyone can do. It's not exclusive to neurodivergent people. Which is partially why I can't just sit here and diagnose Elle as an autistic person. But at the same time, the things that she does and pointing those out in a context of is she or isn't she is really interesting and really important, I think, in bringing awareness to neurodivergent people. Being neurodivergent or autistic is not a bad thing. It's not a thing to fear or really be upset about. I know some people get upset if you say their favorite character is probably neurodivergent, but I don't think they understand what that truly means and how it just means that their brain just works a little bit different. So yeah, this is one of my favorite movies uh, growing up, partially because I was a pink girly. I loved pink as a kid. So of course I loved a character like Elle who her signature color is pink. But also, I just think it's fun to, like, reinvestigate this as an adult, finally knowing that I'm autistic, to see some of my favorite characters and be like, no wonder I liked you so much. We do very similar things, whether they're autistic or not. Either way, I hope this episode was good. I hope it was interesting, and I plan to do more in the future about characters who may potentially be autistic and not just some dits. But with that, keep watching movies, and I'll see you next week. 